My name is uh, Marie Forrester, and I'm here this morning uh, to welcome you all and to uh, pre be the be the introducer to our great program this morning from Nick, uh, Mawada Park, From Wilds to War. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Nick to you. Uh, Nick, you see him there on the screen, is a full-time historical researcher for No History, K-N-O-W, history, because yes, Nick, we have lots of history, a historical services firm that specializes in researching documenting and presenting Canada's past. Before his career at No History, Nick received his Bachelor's of Arts with Honours Degree from St. Francis Xavier University and then completed his Master's Degree at the U of C in 2019. More broadly, Nick specializes in First World War commemoration and military history. Now you might not know this, who was behind the scenes, but Nick, has a long volunteer resume, and most recently was our Remembrance Day Memorial, the Field of Crosses, thanks Nick, that takes place annually in November in Calgary. Fantastic, thanks so much, Marie. So as a bit of a brief introduction to sort of get us situated on the park itself, um, with one of the primary communities that had been involved in the settlement of the West, Calgary experienced rapid growth in the later half of the 19th century. As Hamza sort of gave a bit of detail into historically, the Nitsitafi people have lived where the Bow and Elbow Rivers meet, which the area around what is now Calgary and was significant to all Treaty 7 nations as the confluence of the two rivers has always been a cultural district and a place where trade and gathering would often occur. And because of this strategic location, Fort Calgary was built in 1875 by the Northwest Mounted Police as part of Sir Johnny Macdonald's dream of this sea to sea nation, which was designed to connect the Atlantic and Pacific portions of Canada. And to oversee this, William Pierce, an inspector for the Dominion Land Agencies in Ottawa, was brought in to oversee the land title claims in the Western regions. Now, Pierce believed that a visually attractive town was vital to draw in visitors and residents to Fort Calgary as a whole. And once the fort was built, this dream was realized as settlers began to move to the region. And you have the official creation of Calgary as a town in 1884 because it had had its own government, agricultural industry, newspaper. And at this time in 1884, there was approximately 500 residents. And while the growth of the city continued to continue, you have this public expectation increase as well throughout the early years of Calgary's existence, with this emphasis placed on recreational activities, which had been an extremely important component of sort of Victorian era life with sort of physical literacy and physical health. And so, for example, facilities such as gardens, children's playgrounds, athletic fields, amusement parks, um, zoological displays, and agricultural exhibitions were all considered vital for this prosperous Calgary. So to please the public, in 1884, the community had requested land from the Dominion government for use as a public park space. And the request was approved at an initial section of a bare land adjacent to the Bow River at the far west end of town was transferred to the municipality of Calgary. And the space set aside in 1884 was to become what was known as the city of Calgary's first public park and was re later renamed Mawada Park after a Cree word meaning, oh, be joyful. I've also seen in a few different uh, historical texts that had been translated as well to, oh, be happy. So I think it's sort of different dependent on who you're speaking to. Now, while this area was often overlooked in later years of the 19th and early 20th centuries, it did become a popular public destination throughout much of the 20th century. So the park would develop into a bustling sports and recreation facility, and later the site of one of Western Canada's most um, recognizable military drill halls, which was renamed the Mawada Armory, that is still in use to this day and is a common staple in the downtown skyline. So the stadium 
was to be built west of the Mawada Armory and served as a sporting venue, as well as a space for military parade grounds and presentations. The stadium would hold numerous different sporting teams. Um, one that was developed from the Calgary Tigers, which is a team that participated in the newly formed Alberta Rugby Union in 1909, which as I'll get into a little bit more detail further on, that develops into what is now the Calgary Stampeders. And Mawada Park also serves as a multi-purpose ground that was a site of many historical events and contentious decisions that lead to many of the activities and sites Calgary residents enjoy and witness to this day. And the location of this park on the west end of the city was a prime location for residents who worked and lived near the downtown core. And as I've mentioned before, it remains as a popular destination for activity seekers. Okay, so to continue, you have the development of this plot of land set aside for what was become known as Mawada Park. And it was one of complexity and very slow decision making. So after the Dominion government had granted the land to the city, it had gone unused for nearly 20 years because it was often overlooked as parkland despite being set aside for that particular purpose. In 1890, because of the unuse of the space, the town had filed for permission to convert this space to a waterworks pumping station. And as well, in September of the same year, it was offered to the Canadian Pacific Railway for a train works yard However, this offer was declined and it would remain sort of at that southern area just south of around 9th Avenue, I believe it is. And because of this declination, the land would remain unused until 1906. And to sort of backtrack slightly, by 1904, you've had the growth of Calgary to a population of roughly 4,000 people. And as this growth continues, you have this desire for more public space. So this untouched plot of land amassed 26 and a quarter acres, and it was sitting on this prime location between downtown Calgary and the Bow River, which had the CPR railway to the south. The transformation of the city into a bustling community meant that the public had much higher expectations. And so in 1906, the residents had voted in favor of a new bylaw which had been designed to increase the city's investments into parks to a total of $23,000 in what is compared to the 1906 budget of $2,858, which was supposed to cover things such as regular maintenance and caretaker wages, but often couldn't cover anything else. And along with the increase in funds for the park department, it was decided by the Parks and Cemeteries Committee that they wanted to hire an architect with the sole purpose of overseeing the development of park space as a whole throughout Calgary. And the clear choice for Chairman Hunt was an American landscape architect who was living in Montreal at the time, Frederick Todd, who was also the designer behind Mount Royal Park in the south of the city. And while the plan for the park development were highly evident, Hunt would leave abruptly in 1907 and as a result, there was the push to build the water park was later stalled. However, following the departure of Hunt, you have the cancelling of Frederick Todd's contract and the funds were reallocated to different city projects, which would include the development of Victoria Park into an exhibition space. And while the city deemed that the creation of an exhibition ground was highly important, many citizens and sports clubs did not agree with this decision. So three years later in 1910, this parks superintendent was hired by the city of Calgary with the goal specifically to oversee the development of parks. So John Buchanan out of Guelph, Ontario, who is seen in the middle of the slide here, was hired and was one of the monumental decisions that signified the official birth of city of Calgary parks. One of his first suggested areas of improvement was to design an overall public park system rather than individual sections, which the designed goal of growing public interest to educate public staff on the proper care and value of parks, and most importantly, to generate public funding. A total budget of $100,000 was proposed by Buchanan to oversee the care and maintenance of five separate park spaces, which included the Island Parks, Riley Park, the Central Park, you have Union Cemetery, and Mawada Park as well. 
and the appointment of John Buchanan proved to be vital for the development of the water park into Calgary's largest and most used parks in the early 20th century. And Mawada Park had been unique in many separate ways, but one of its most accessed attributes was its sports fields, as you can see in the slide, that was used by numerous uh, recreation enthusiasts and athletic clubs, and even professional rugby club, the Calgary Tigers, who I mentioned becomes the Calgary Stampeders. In 1912, many upgrades were made to the park space with 1,355 spruce trees that had been brought in from Banff were planted throughout the park. And in the early years of the space itself, there had been a wading pool installed in the Northwest corner that had been excavated and filled in with concrete and replaced with gymnastics play apparatuses specifically for children's use. And so part of the park space was part of this proposed building project, the Moana Armory, which I'll get into in a little bit more detail. And as a result, most of the funds for the park were allocated towards upkeep rather than further development. And while the discussions about a potential structure in the park went into 1913, it did not often occur or deter public use of the space. The superintendent argued that every inch of Moana Park was needed for athletic purposes and that the park's infrastructure resembled this feeling. To, over, to help accommodate this large scale growth, there was a creation and establishment of a bandstand. You have baseball and football grounds. You had a running track put in and jumping pits, which did take up much of this space. However, it was extremely used during this period. And the city had announced in 1913 that a total of 555 games in total were played throughout 1913. You have 352 baseball, 174 soccer games, and 29 rugby matches. A drinking fountain was installed along with further bleachers to better accommodate the influx of people. And all park structures and furniture were painted white and green, giving this park a cohesive appearance. The prime location of the park along the west side of downtown Calgary meant that it was often sought by building developers. And even in 1912, when the Parks and Recreation Department were deciding on possible upgrades to the space, this contentious topic of building the armory was on the minds of decision makers. And so it appeared more and more likely that the armory was going to be built on this land. So as one of the fastest growing cities in North America, you now have Calgary's population at roughly 74,000 people in 1912. And with this growth continued the rise of Calgary and Canada as a whole, you have the federal government seeking to reform Canada's military policies. The federal government was looking to grow the national military and was hoping to do so in a way that relied heavily on militiamen, therefore not fully registered and enlisted soldiers. The Department of National Defense estimated in 1908 that over 350 drill halls were required nationally. While this goal was never a reality, nearly 100 were completed in the early years of the 20th century, which gave Canada its largest ever military presence. So while the militia, which is now known as reserves, acts as a visual and physical symbol of military presence in Canada, sociologists often argue that the militia was a civic and military institution which serves social and political functions, and its inherent hybridity serves as a vital bridge between military and civilian realms, which was one of the firm goals of Sam Hughes, which I'll get into in a little more detail in a minute. And this important relationship between the military and civilian sectors meant that the infrastructure itself was required to allow for residents to participate in these militia programs in their spare time. In 1907, the government had organized the military district number 13 and selected Calgary as its headquarters to compensate for the growing military presence in the city, as well as just in Western Canada as a whole. 
the Department of National Defense was willing to build an armory in Calgary, as was evident, but site-related disputes often led to the delay. So initially, five lots that had initially been known as the Alexander Estate, which was an old isolation hospital on the outskirts of the city, were offered to the Department of National Defense. Lieutenant Colonel Ernest A. Cruikshank had initially declined this offer because he found that the site was often too small and confining because it did not offer adequate space for the troops to parade and would also prevent for future expansion if the city were to continue growing or you have this need for the military to constantly grow. However, despite Cruikshank's reservations with the Alexander Estate, the Department of National Defense decided to go ahead with the space and signed an additional agreement with City of Calgary Mayor Arthur Leslie Cameron to allow for the militia to parade on certain sections of Victoria Park. Therefore, they were using different areas of the city to compensate for this growth. And as well, to oversee the building of this armory, the Department of National Defense hired military engineer milita or, uh, Major Carey from Winnipeg with a budget of roughly $150,000. And while there was this strong desire from the military perspective to move forward with the Alexander estate, there were political considerations that would come into account. So beginning in 1911, you have the transfer of property, which had led into the federal election of 1911 as well. Historians have argued that the expediency and development of the new armory, coupled with the government's recent promise to grant the Western provinces control of their own natural resources, showed that the Liberal government in Ottawa was really going out of their way to get into the good graces of Calgary constituents in order to win in the polls and continue as a government leader. Now, despite the Liberal hopes and strong attempts to increase the public approval ahead of the election, the long-standing Wilfrid Laurier government were defeated by the Conservatives led by Robert Borden. So Borden won 134 seats to Laurier's 87, and with this brought many policy changes and staffing updates. And one of the most influential of these changes in relation to the water park specifically was the promotion of Sam Hughes to Minister of Militia and Defense, which was really evident in the expansion of the Canadian military and especially relating to areas such as militias. So as you can see in the image here, you have Crookshank and Sam Hughes together there. So Hughes believed in bringing together civilian populations and the military. So he believed that drill halls and armories would build up this relationship while also sharing on defense costs. He also argued that an expanded armory would stimulate preparedness, encourage youth training, and serve as a public hall, so therefore a space of meeting for many local activities that were not necessarily restricted to members of the militia. Hughes's dream of an expanded armory program did not fit with pre-negotiated funding and resources that had initially been allocated. And as a result, the Alexander estate was no longer a viable option for the armory. With these changes and Alexander estate no longer being viable, alternate locations were looked at and they were seeking something much larger. And so Hughes nearly doubled his predecessor's allotment for construction buildings, work, and engineering services by 1914, which even surpassed the spending increases in military expenditure for arms, ordnance, and equipment. So Hughes's desire for the building of a Calgary armory aligned with that of newly elected Member of Parliament for Calgary, Richard Bedford Bennett, who is also better known as RB and their relationship would prove to be vital in the military development of the city. As is evident, land speculation in Calgary had neared its peak in 1911, making city land scarce and increasingly expensive. So to put more pressure on this project, the first major training camp for Southern Alberta, 
took place in Calgary with more than 2,000 attendees from the city and other close by Alberta communities. And as a result, Calgary lacked the proper space to house this large scale of a number. And therefore training had often been spread throughout the various spaces and buildings throughout the city. Bennett began pressing government agencies and officials such as the Minister of Public Works to build a $250,000 structure, which surpassed that 150,000 initial allotment. And the House of Commons began discussing the matter of this Western Armory because Hughes had argued that municipalities offering valuable sites were more likely to receive favorable consideration. But Calgary itself had not put forth a valuable property since the defeat of the Liberal government. On the 21st of June 1912, Hughes's dream of a Calgary drill hall was approved with an initial approval of $50,000 for construction and an additional $50,000 requested in 1913. So as you can kind of see, it appeared that varying different levels of government agencies couldn't really agree on what the value of this should be versus what the value of the land should be. And so with the approval of the armory being finalized, the location was still up for discussion. The initial locations discussed under the Liberal government were either no longer available or weren't desirable to Hughes and the military. So Bennett had had his eyes set on a prime piece of real estate on the west end of downtown that to him seemed ideally suited for a bold military building, which was known as Mawada Park. So as I sort of mentioned in the initial stages of the presentation, you have the athletic facilities currently at Mawada Park being highly used by citizens, and it was believed that the armory would stand out against its surroundings and be seen by Calgarians on a daily basis, which is part of what made this site so desirable. On the 17th of March 1913, City Council voted to approve the armory with seven council members for the building of the armory at Mawada and four were against. Now, while it initially appeared 160,000 square feet of the park would be donated to the armory after the city council had approved the armory matter, other organizations such as the Calgary Trades and Labor Council had voted against the transfer of the Mawada site on the grounds that the site was needed for recreation and athletic purposes. As a result, the matter was also brought back to City Council in August of 1913, as Alderman Garden believed the issue of building at Mawada should be brought to a public vote. As it was becoming apparent, it was becoming increasingly difficult for Bennett to obtain the land itself for the armory because of Alberta's political structure more broadly. So the armory project, which was led and funded by the federal government, however, the land itself had belonged to the city of Calgary. So the land acquisition was problematic when looking at the original 1902 Crown Grant that stipulated that the land would have to be used for park purposes only. Along with this stipulation, Section 159 of the City Charter gave the municipal government the authority to dispose of their land, but they could not do so without obtaining speci or special legislation from the provincial government. Therefore, all three tiers of government were, were required in order to have this occur and it often seemed like they were just never on the same page. In response to these newly found rules, the city was forced to rescind its initial offer and seek an alternative space. In response to the legal findings, city council decided that no part of Mawada was to be transferred for the purpose of building an armory an attempt until rather an attempt was made to find a more equally desirable location. Numerous property owners at this um, concept 
contacted the city. However, none were exactly what the city had been looking for because it often seemed like they had sort of set their mind on the specific space and they weren't really willing to change their mind. And so despite the multiple newly proposed sites, the issue continued to revolve around Bennett's desire to have the Mawada park space. And one of the primary arguments put forth by council was the cost and sale, or sorry, cost and scale of use in comparison to that of an athletic field. So for example, Alderman Freeze argued, and I quote, it looks as if it must be Mawada Park or nothing. If we want a dinky armory or a dinky site, we may get it. But if we want a fine looking armory on a good site, we must use Mawada Park. The armory would look fine if it was put up there. So Alderman Freeze was arguing that they had had the plans all along and that they had called for two big towers on the building, which would be built so they would look just directly down 8th Avenue. The goal of council was to have a meeting with them and the athletic organizations of the city that were interested in the park for the purpose of talking the question over with them and was supposed to come in the following weeks of 1913. However, he concluded that they were the chief opponents, but he also believed that they want, he was trying to get them to see the matter in the right light because it would be foolish to pay out $150,000 for a site just because, or to lose out on this $150,000 construction project just because the site itself was desired as a soccer field. And so Frieza's statement to council shows that there was this desire to build at Mawada Park and that they believed it greatly outweighed the need for it as a recreation space. In a narrow victory, council had again voted that a small section of Mawada be donated to the armory. And it appeared that the debate was ending. However, as is evident throughout a media war that ensued following council's most recent vote, Stortus began to stall this progress even further. The Morning Albertan, which was Calgary's pro-liberal daily paper, opposed the project and that the daily paper believed that the armory would take the heart right out of the park. However, in contrast, the Calgary Daily Herald supported the armory proposal in the belief that the abundance of militiamen in Calgary, who presently lacked proper training space, would use the land each week to uphold Borden's vision of a national defense program and would often outweigh the scale of people. So as you mentioned, you have this 2000 person coming from the first camp throughout Alberta and that number for constant use would outweigh any use from a recreational purpose. The Herald also argued that the armory would only affect the use of one soccer field and that the militia would only have right on the armory ground itself and not within the park. So the paper went on to argue that one soccer field would average 25, peoples a day, 25 people a day, whereas this armory would serve thousands weekly. In response to the multiple positions and the discussion that the recreation organizations of the city were having was to ally with the anti-armory movement and the Herald argued that on the evening of the 22nd of August, 1913, the athletic organizations would eventually act wisely in refusing to ally themselves with a hysterical campaign that was being waged by political forces to prevent the location of an armory in Mawada. And as a result, the athletes who used the park realized that the building of the armory would take up a small section of the park itself and that the small space would not be missed once other soccer fields were in working condition at Mawada Park itself and throughout the city as a whole. The paper also argued that the athletic organizations of Calgary believe that the militia is entitled to consideration because it was one of the largest sources of military defense in the region. And so despite the multiple different positions, that numerous organizations and political factions had in the city for and against the armory project, it came down to a balance of priorities. So as a result, one Calgarian argued that the mouthpiece of the political faction, which is opposing the granting of a site in Mawada Park for the armory is horrified. Today it asks, and I quote, are we going to give away the best part of our most convenient park 
which we refuse to give up to accommodate our own school children to give it to the Dominion government for a drill hall. So it sort of appeared that there were multiple different perspectives as there were those who thought, why do we need a military component here specifically? And why does it need this land that had already been pre-established and used by the current citizens of the city? And so while there were those who believed that the park space should be reserved specifically for use by Calgarians for their own purposes, those involved in the militia often resided in Calgary and represented a well-renowned faction in the city. And yet it appeared not to be qualified to have space in the park. And so on the 22nd of August, 1913, those who had been opposed to the building of the armory on Mawada Park land met at the Calgary YMCA to put an end to the discussions once and for all. This event had been well attended, which had overflowed the designated committee room and branched out into different spaces within the YMCA building itself. Speeches were then given by athletes, militiamen who opposed the building. You have spokesmen from numerous organizations and professional associations. You have aldermen from without, within the city and members of the general public as well. The pro-armory position would prevail from this meeting with overwhelming success. However, immediately following this initial meeting, you have the anti-Mawada faction that would leave this section and went to host their own meeting specifically to them to follow their belief that this land transfer had been illegal. The legality of the land transfer for the armory had been this last line of defense attempt to keep Mawada from the building being used. The primary argument had been that the land belonged to all Calgary taxpayers and that city council could not just give away the space without consent of all the residents. The anti-armory movement would hire Clifford T. Jones as their attorney and a week later, the formal proceedings would begin. Jones argued that the land should not be given away without discussions with the provincial legislature because of this three-tiered political system that I had spoken about previously. However, city solicitor C.J. Ford argued that the city had no intention of transferring the property without discussions with the Alberta legislature and thus the Calgary City Council's actions were, were not illegal. The court would dismiss the injunction proceedings because of Ford's attempts to seek provincial approval initially. The result was considered an anti-armory victory, however, because the armory could not proceed while the matter was under judicial review, and the question of land transfer was now a provincial issue, which would come with it its own set of political challenges. At the time, Arthur Sifton's Liberals dominated the provincial legislature, but most of the Calgary members were conservative, which created this great deal of internal strife over the Moana project. For example, the Calgary Council presented a bill in the legislature on the 25th of October 1913 with the initial goal of transferring the portion of the park to the armory but it faced heavy opposition from the Liberal members of the legislature. The bill had been thrown out of Parliament by a vote of 25 to 16, and was often related as this sort of Liberal versus Conservative debate. And despite the result of this bill, City Council would continue to push forward a plebiscite to be voted on during Municipal Election Day, along with two other plebiscite questions. While the response to the question in council was not legally binding because of the results of the provincial bill, those opposed would find it difficult to continue to count, cancel this proposed armory project with public support being behind its construction. In the 1913 municipal election, many of the city polling divisions voted in favor of the transfer of Mawada Park land. There was a total of 3,660 votes four and 1,438 votes against, which swayed heavily in favor of the armory's construction. The Calgary Herald, which was a pro 
Armory newspaper argued that with the overwhelming majority of approximately three to one in its favor, the proposition to locate the armory in Mawada Park will be taken up at once with the Dominion government to carry out the wishes of a majority of Calgary citizens. The city of Calgary mayor as well, Herbert Arthur Sinat, stated that he was ready to contact the city's legal team in order to discuss the process and terms necessary to transfer the land to the proposed armory. With the overwhelming support of the public and the majority vote of city council, which was evident through those two votes, Sinat argued that there is now nothing to prevent the building going there, referring to the Moana Armory site that had been proposed. So after this long and complicated process for finalizing the location of the armory at Moana Park, the next debate would become one of construction. In August 1914, with the declaration of the First World War, had brought with it this sense of nationalism and war fever to Canada. And so with troops and resourcing being allocated towards the war effort in Europe itself, the building of the armory was lowered in the priority list and was replaced with this desire for those to house and train large numbers of troops destined to fight overseas. So it was sort of using what was available at the time rather than focusing on what would be used further on down the road. So because of this, it was not until early 1916 that the land was officially obtained by the federal government and transferred following Calgary's, or sorry, cabinet's approval of the transfer for the sum of $1. The contract of building was officially offered to Vancouver Construction Company, A.G. Creelman, on the 12th of September, 1916, with the proposed completion date of fall 1918. The building was designed by T.W. Fuller of the Federal Department of Public Works, who was supervised by local architect Leo Dowler. Parks Canada described the completed armory as follows a large low mass structure in the Tudor Gothic style and is set around a large central drill hall, which you can see in the image below. Constructed of red brick with stone and sandstone trim, its rugged battlement facade conveys a strong image of solidity and impregnability. The main entrance is a low central troop door flanked by projecting three stony crenellated towers in the matter of fortress architecture. The building had small, narrow windows, bartizans, and small turrets complete with firing slits. And following the First World War, the armory became, as was described by a different historian, a source of civic pride, and the armory was a visual reminder that the war had become part of Calgary's consciousness. After the First World War, you start to see more use in the armory of itself. And in 1919, it would begin to house the newly created Calgary Regiment, whose first battalion is better known today as the Calgary Highlanders. The second battalion, which was an armored regiment in 1936, is better known today as the King's Own Calgary Regiment and is still stationed within the armory itself. Other units, such as the numerous units of the Royal Canadian Artillery, Royal Canadian Engineers, the 15th Light Horse Regiment, and multiple support units that have since been disbanded, called the Mawada Armory home. It was estimated that several hundred thousand men passed through the armory during the First and Second World Wars alone, let alone the give or take 80 years outside of those specific wars itself, specifically designed for the militia and reserves training. The facility has acted as a home for militia and cadet organizations following the Second World War, and it's the major Alberta armory still in use to this day. A, according to Parks Canada, the Wada Armory is associated with Calgary's military history and was declared to be an Alberta heritage resource in 1979. The building of the armory, while difficult, 
proved to be a necessity in the mid 20th century and is a constant reminder today of the military culture in Calgary and Western Canada as a whole and what was envisioned by Borden in the earliest days of his leadership. So shifting gears slightly, as the decision to build the armory at Malata Park was one of contention and deep political debate, their activities in the space always remained constant and revolved around sports and recreation. Despite the discussion and fear of an eventual loss of the space to further military development, recreation remained this dominant activity in the park space. Sports such as soccer, baseball, and rugby, as I had mentioned previously, were common, so much so that an official stadium was built for sporting purposes. As a current staple to Calgary, the Calgary Stampeders were not founded until 1945, following the Second World War. However, there were an abundance of teams in various leagues throughout Alberta and Canada that had showed a passion for sport and allowed for the establishment of the Calgary Stampeders, who would eventually call Mawada Stadium their home, and many of their former players have fond memories of the space as a whole. As a bit of context as to how the Stampeders came to be, you have football, or which was rugby more commonly at the beginning, was prominent in Calgary in 1909 with the forming of the Calgary Tigers, which had played in the newly formed rugby union. They were replaced by the Calgary Canucks in 1915, but would only play until 1919 because of the effects of the First World War. However, the sport had been not deterred and the 50th Battalion, who took its name in honor of the military battalion that had provided support to the team. The players were often attached to D Company and their practices would take place at Mawada Park. There was a resurgence of the Calgary Tigers in 1928, and the team made history by completing the first forward pass in Canadian football. So you sort of have this shift from a more rugby style game to what was more of an Americanized football version. And as Canadian football historian Lou Goodwin described in his 1979 book on the Calgary Stampeders, in 1929, a council decision was made to provide a city stadium on the Mawada Park site and the leveling, surfacing with topsoil and the erection of a fence was begun. The building of this stadium at the park made it the city's center for organized sporting events and allowed for space for the newly formed Al <laughs> sorry, Calgary Altomas to play. The Altomas were success or succeeded by the Calgary Bronx in 1935 and played within the Western Interprovincial Football Union until the team folded in 1940 because of the Second World War and many of these soldiers being needed to fight overseas. However, in 1945, after the Second World War, the reemergence of senior football was announced. Multiple former senior players of the previous Calgary teams, to name a few, such as Larry Hayes, you have Jack Lawrence and Hal Harrison, um, and two junior level coaches, such as Bill Wussick and Dean Griffin, were considered available if a new team were to emerge. At an organizational meeting in September of 1945, Jack Grogan was named chairman of the newly formed Calgary football team. And on the 29th of September, a sporting headline read a sen senior football gets go-ahead signal. As a response, Dean Griffin was announced as the head coach with Jerry Seawright as the playing assistant coach, and thus the Calgary Stampeders football club was formed. The Calgary Stampeders were to call Moana Stadium home after the site had gone through much update in the 1930s to accommodate sports enthusiasts and larger 
fan bases. Following City Council's decision to build a stadium at Mawada, in 1931, after convincing the military to remove the Strathcona horse stables from behind the armory, an all-around sports area was developed. In consultation with additional athletic organizations, such as baseball and track and field leaders in Calgary, city leaders approved the building of the stadium. A grandstand with a footprint of 200 by 34 feet was built in 1931 to accommodate up to 2,000 fans and was later upgraded to include an additional 8,000 seats. The stadium also included a dressing room and office accommodation, as well as shower facilities, toilets, and storerooms. And in the initial stages of the use of the stadium, they had only been played during the day until 1939 when lights were installed. A parks report from 1953 argued that the stadium was the center of activity. Throughout the outdoor sports season in Calgary in 1953, favorable weather conditions allowed for the fields to remain in excellent working condition. You had the final Stampeders game of the season played in the stadium on the 14th of November. However, no snow or dampness had been on the field. And as a result, numerous athletic organizations, such as the Junior Rugby Club, you have the High School Athletics Club Association, the Soccer Association, and the Scottish Highland Games Associations, continually holding events in the park further into the winter. And it had recently become apparent to me as well that schools were using this facility for track meets where you'd have like North Calgary schools versus South Calgary schools through part of this 20th century. The report would also argue that the increased interest throughout Calgary in all sporting events would bring larger crowds to Mawada Stadium which would require the construction of more service buildings and restroom facilities. The Calgary Stampeders would play all of their home games at Mawada until 1959, when McMahon Stadium was built for the 1960 state or season. The Stampeders final game at Mawada took place on the 20th of July, 1960, and was fittingly a 25-24 victory over the Edmonton Eskimos in an exhibition match. The game day program argued that while those witnessing the Stampeders playing in the stadium for the last time would have fond memories of the stadium and their experiences in it, they were ready for the move to McMahon, which would hold up to 20,000 fans and was the largest stadium in Canada at the time. A $45,000 scoreboard that was installed in 1959 in Mawada Park was to be moved to the new stadium. And the program also argued that everything else, including the losing habit, will be left at Mawada. And as would appear with recent Calgary Stampeders form, that seems like that losing habit may have actually been left at this stadium. <laughs> And as we have witnessed, sorry, the Stampeders appeared ready to move on from the Mawada Stadium as the game day program from the Stampeders versus the Winnipeg Boo Bombers on the 15th of August, 1960, argued that while the stadium was sufficient for the team that went all the way in 1948 and brought the Grey Cup to Calgary for the first time, had left much to be desired for the fans and players of a professional team in what was described as a surge ahead city like Calgary. <laughs> the condition of the stadium had begun to deteriorate in the later parts of the 1950s and, the, and leading into its demolition and the city had been discussing what the best course of action for the stadium should be. The site was still home to numerous Bantam, high school, and junior football games, but was still underused and often sitting empty. It was in 1998 that the stadium was set to be torn down and replaced by what is today known as Shaw Millennium Park, which was a skateboarding facility. And 
Calgary Stampeders legends, Ezra Sugarfoot Anderson and Normie Kwong, who are shown in the photo below, had fond memories of playing in the stadium. Sugarfoot stated that he loved playing at Moana because, and I quote, it was the only park that I knew at the time and the people were so close to me. You know, it was almost like having family playing up there. He also had fond memories of when he would used to allow children to sneak in under a broken piece of fence to watch the games. And coincidentally enough, Normie Kwong was quoted as saying that he remembers being one of these children who would used to sneak into Stampeders games. And he told the Calgary Herald that he believed that the groundskeepers left the holes open for them specifically just to let them in, even though it had only costed a quarter to attend these games at that time. Kwong also stated that while certain aspects of the stadium were falling into a state of disrepair, specifically the showers and dressing rooms, which lacked cleanliness and had holes throughout the flooring, the field itself had a reputation as the best turf in the West. The demolition of the stadium in 1999 had saddened Anderson, who had such strong feelings about the facility. He had remembered playing in the stadium and spoke about the soldiers in the armory, opening the blinds to their windows to watch the games, which he described as being the best seats in the house, which is just sort of a really good way of showcasing this sort of military civilian culture and full use of this space as a whole. He also recalled speaking with a gentleman who used to work as a Stampeders ticket salesman at Moana, who stated that he had specifically quit buying season tickets because the McMahon Stadium was just too far away, while Moana Stadium had been right around the corner for him. He had also argued that it wouldn't feel right to go with the stadium gone because he would drive past it daily and remember all the fond memories he would have had while in that stadium as a whole. And while the stadium no longer exists in Moata Park, there is the strong legacy of the space in the history of Calgary sports and its supporters. So in conclusion, you have Calgary's first park known as Moata, which had been vital for very many different reasons. The central location of the park had made it desirable for recreation enthusiasts from children using the play apparatuses to adults participating in organized sports and everything in between. While there were those who believed it should have been reserved specifically for re recreation activities as it was intended, the likes of R.B. Bennett and Sam Hughes believed it would act as a prime location for the new armory. Despite attempts from the local populations to prevent this building from occurring, it had been approved in 1913 and construction beginning in the 1916 year. The armory was completed in 1918 and still stands to this day on the same 160,000 square foot that it was granted. While there were those who believed that the site would become just another military parade ground, the desire of Calgary residents outweighed that of military prowess and thus the space remained a hot spot of sports and recreation. The popularity of football, specifically in Canada, and the building of Moata Stadium allowed for sports to thrive in the park with the image of the Tudor Gothic armory in the background, which also helped to symbolize Canadian military culture and togetherness that emerged after the First and Second World Wars. I would also argue that the establishment of the stadium and the development of football specifically in Canada could be behind what caused the park to maintain its use as a park space and for sports and recreation because there was this strong desire by the city to come to this space specifically because of what was occurring in the space itself. The stadium, however, was eventually demolished in 1998 however, did not restrict the park from being used for what it was designed. Shaw Millennium Park, which consists of a 75,000 square foot skateboard park, stage and amphitheater, it also includes basketball courts and a beach volleyball court, 
was constructed in 2000 and remains to this day a popular destination for recreation enthusiasts that has on average 35,000 visitors per year. I also stumbled across this image the other day while I was sort of just surfing social media aimlessly. And I found it was a very strong image for concluding this presentation because I felt that it showcases the multiple different functions that Calgary citizens were considering and concerned it would lose with the building of the armory as itself. And that to this day, over a century later, the park is still sought after by recreation enthusiasts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for um, all that information. And it's so nice to see. And it's fascinating to see how a, a place has made so many changes and, and it still is there and, and it's being used for what it was uh, designed to use for. Um, and, and thank you for that wonderful presentation and all that information you've shared with us. Um, I would like to invite all of our attendees to ask their questions via using either the chat or the Q&A option at the bottom of their screen. Who actually owns the land or armory now? That is a good question. And I am honestly not sure. I believe it still belongs to the federal government as part of the Canadian military specifically the armory itself. And I think the park itself is part of the city of Calgary. Uh, we have one that's just come in from Nicole. What was the most surprising thing you stumbled on in your research? Being someone who sort of studied military history more on my own, it was something that I didn't realize as much politics went into the building of some of these facilities as a whole, like the armory, for example. Um, especially I always assumed that the Canadian military would take priority on a lot of these things. Like we need this space to build an army for national defense or whatever it may be. And so we're taking it. And so sort of seeing how the process itself worked out, it kind of makes me just sort of question many of these other things that have been built throughout Canada as a whole. And, you know, sort of question sort of some of these structures elsewhere. And I, just, I think that to me was the most interesting part, my perspective. Well, that's great. Now we've got a question from Zorica. Is it possible to visit the building and see the interior just as a tourist? That I don't know. Um, because it is still used as a military facility, I think you may be allowed to enter it for certain purposes, but I think it needs to be requested. Mm. Um, but don't quote me on that. From Elizabeth as well, did the armory have a swimming pool? I'm not sure if the armory itself did there. However, there was a swimming pool at Moata Park. So there was one there throughout much of the 20th century. Uh, from Craig, was there much interaction between Moata Armory and the military camp that was located at Battalion Park? I, From what I'd read through a bit of my research, um, it wasn't overly definitive. However, I think you would have had training with the similar departments just because they were located in the same city and you have Sam Hughes, especially trying to, or his goal was initially to have sort of this cooperation throughout the city. Um, and you would have seen a lot of it, especially in the first and second world wars with troop placements and sort of training purposes, especially. Um, but on the more official level, I'm not certain how much of it still occurs. Um, because I think you have the separate regiments housed in the different areas. All right. Um, do you have, Nick, any, any last thoughts uh, that may have come to mind after the presentation um, that you would like to share with our attendees? There, I found a couple of extremely interesting resources. So there was one um, written by um, Whitney P. Lackenbauer, who was a historian who wrote his master's thesis on military property development in Canada. And so I think if, this is like the armory specifically itself is something that, and you have lots of interest in. It's something that I would definitely recommend looking into because it was far more detail and information in that, that I could ever put into an hour presentation. And as a historian I've met actually in the past, like he just does an outstanding job of articulating his thoughts and it's a very well detailed um, way to do it. And then also I do want to thank uh, Daryl Slade, who is a historian for the Calgary Stampeders. Um, without some of his help, I probably wouldn't have been able to have a section on sports specifically. Um, 
because of COVID, you weren't able to get an archive. So he was willing to uh, lend me um, a bunch of different sources that allowed us to have um, as in-depth of a presentation as I was able to, to give. Well, that's great. Um, we don't have any more questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Nick, for taking the time out and being here with us today and also our attendees for joining us this morning for this amazing presentation. Um, now, with that said, I'll just pass it over to Marie to close us off here. Thank you, Hamza. And thank you, Nick. I, I really enjoyed that uh, presentation because I've always thought that this is our little sleeper park that was slow to get started, but also one of our most stubborn parks because it refuses to give up and it's been renewed in different ways over and over. Um, also, Nick, I just really appreciate that fascinating history uh, about what we could build there, who's going to build it, should we let it happen. It's kind of, Nick, as you must know as an historian, a same old, same old story <laughs> as that's unfolding in the city right now. Uh, you know, we have some places that have been used for certain things and then people are hard to let it go or else they're eager to have something new. One of the things, Nick, I got to know a little bit just talking with you and I'd like to share with the audience is that uh, it, Nick, besides his, you know, the research in, in writing and uh, online, he had excellent opportunities to talk to people uh, in the city who knew uh, lots about the history of the park from a long time ago. And I think that's just great that we're including primary resources in learning more about our system our city. So thank you so much for that, Nick. And just Nick, thank you for putting up that last photo, because I'm not sure a lot of people do realize how viable the park is now. And that just brought it right to the forefront uh, that, you know, we had our planetarium and it's now our contemporary Calgary and we've got our Shaw Park. And I'm not sure people realize how big it is, and that, that area is also used for a lot of festivals. It truly is, just like you said, Nick, a really important part, in not only in the history of Calgary, but in the future of it. And so I thank you so much for spotlighting and letting us know about that this morning. Please remember, like Hamza said, to check our, our website for the rest of this week, but also for our programs uh, throughout the year.